1. The First Commandment 1. The First Commandment and the Shema Israel The prologue to the Ten Commandments introduces not only the law as a whole, but leads directly to the First Commandment. And God spake all these words, saying, I am the Lord thy God, which have bought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Exodus chapter 20, verses 1 to 3. In this declaration, God identifies himself, first, as the Lord, the self-existent and absolute one. Second, he reminds Israel that he is their saviour and that their relationship to him, thy God, is therefore one of grace. God chose Israel, not Israel God. Third, the law is given to the people of grace. All men are already judged, fallen and lost. All men are under the wrath of the law, a penalty which the quaking mountain and the fact of death for unhallowed approach underscored. Exodus chapter 19, verses 16 to 25. The law is given to the people saved by grace as their way of grace, to set forth the privilege and blessing of the covenant. Fourth, it follows then that the first response of grace, as well as the first principle of the law, is this. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. In analysing this commandment, we must examine the implications of it cited by Moses. Now these are the commandments, the statutes, and the judgments which the Lord your God commanded to teach you, that ye might do them in the land whether ye go to possess it, that thou mightest fear the Lord thy God, to keep all his statutes and his commandments, which I command thee, thou, and thy son, and thy son's son, all the days of thy life, and that thy days may be prolonged. Hear therefore, O Israel, and observe to do it, that it may be well with thee, and that ye may increase mightily, as the Lord God of thy fathers hath promised thee, in the land that floweth with milk and honey. Deuteronomy chapter 6 Verses 1 to 3. First, the reason for the giving of these commandments is to awaken the fear of God, and that fear might prompt obedience. Because God is God, the absolute Lord and lawgiver, fear of God is the essence of sanity and common sense. To depart from a fear of God is to lack any sense of reality. Second, the maintenance of the fear of God would bring prosperity and the increase of the nation promised to the fathers. The increase of the nation had been promised to the patriarchs from the very first. Genesis chapter 12 verse 1, compare Leviticus chapter 26 verse 9. It is therefore necessary to maintain this fear and obedience from generation to generation. In Deuteronomy chapter 6 verses 4 to 9, we come to a central and basic declaration of the first principle of the law. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, and thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart and with all thy soul, and with all thy might. And these words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart, and thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children, and shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thine house, and when thou walkest by the way, and when thou liest down, and when thou risest up. And thou shalt bind them for a sign upon thine hand, and they shall be as frontlets between thine eyes and thou shalt write them upon the posts of thy house and on thy gates. The first two verses, chapter 6, verses 4 and 5, are the Shema Israel, 
recited as the morning and evening prayer of Israel, and considered by the rabbis to contain the principles of the Decalogue. The second portion of the Shema, verse 5, is echoed in Deuteronomy chapter 10, verses 12 to 13. And now, Israel, what doth the Lord thy God require of thee, but to fear the Lord thy God, to walk in all his ways, and to love him, and to serve the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, to keep for thy good the commandments of the Lord, and his statutes, which I command thee this day. Deuteronomy chapter 6 verse 5 is cited by Christ as the first and great commandment. Matthew chapter 22 verse 38, Mark chapter 12 verse 30, Luke chapter 10 verse 27. That is, as the essential and basic principle of the law. The premise of this commandment is, however, Deuteronomy chapter 6 verse 4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. The Christian affirmation of this is the declaration, We worship one God in Trinity, and Trinity in unity. It is a faith in the unity of the Godhead, as opposed to the belief in God's many and Lord's many. The consequences for law of this fact are total. It means one God, one law. The premise of polytheism is that we live in a multiverse, not a universe, that a variety of law orders and hence lords exist, and that man cannot therefore be under one law except by virtue of imperialism. Modern legal positivism denies the existence of any absolute. It is hostile because of its relativism to the concept of a universe and of a universe of law. Instead, societies of men exist, each with its own order of positive law, and each order of law lacks any absolute or universal validity. The law of Buddhist states is seen as valid for Buddhist nations, the law of Islam for Muslim states, the laws of pragmatism for humanistic states, and the laws of scripture for Christian states, but none, it is held, have the right to claim that their law represents truth in any absolute sense. This, of course, militates against the biblical declaration that God's order is absolute and absolutely binding on men and nations. Even more, because an absolute law is denied, it means that the only universal law possible is an imperialistic law, a law imposed by force and having no validity other than the coercive imposition. Any one world order on such a premise is of necessity imperialistic. Having denied absolute law, it cannot appeal to men to return to the true order from whence man has fallen. A relativistic, pragmatic law has no premise for missionary activity. The truth it proclaims is no more valid than the truth held by the people it seeks to unite to itself. If it holds, we are better off one cannot justify this statement except by saying, I hold it to be so, to which the resistor can reply, I hold that we are better off many. Under pragmatic law, it is held that every man is his own law system, because there is no absolute overarching law order. But this means anarchy. Thus, while pragmatism or relativism or existentialism, positivism or any other form of this faith holds to the absolute immunity of the individual, implicitly or explicitly, in effect, its only argument is the coercion of the individual 
because it has no other bridge between man and man. It can speak of love, but there is no ground calling love more valid than hate. Indeed, the Marquis de Sade logically saw no crime in murder. On nominalistic, relativistic grounds, what could be wrong with murder? If there is no absolute law, then every man is his own law. As a writer of Judges declared, In those days there was no king in Israel, that is, the people had rejected God as king. Every man did that which was right in his own eyes. Judges chapter 21 verse 25, compare chapter 17 verse 6, chapter 18 verse 1, chapter 19 verse 1. The law forbids man's self-law. He shall not do after all the things that we do here this day. Every man whatsoever is right in his own eyes. Deuteronomy chapter 12 verse 8. And this applies to worship as well as to moral order. The first principle of the Shema Israel is thus. One God, one law. It is the declaration of an absolute moral order to which man must conform. If Israel cannot admit another God and another law order, it cannot recognize any other religion or law order as valid, either for itself or for anyone else. Because God is one, truth is one. Other people will perish in their way, lest they turn and be converted. Psalm 2 verse 12 The basic coercion is reserved to God. Because God is one, and truth is one, the one law has an inner coherence. The unity of the Godhead appears in the unity and coherence of the law. Instead of being strata of diverse origins and utility, the law of God is essentially one word, a unified whole. Modern political orders are polytheistic imperial states, but the churches are not much better. To hold, as the churches do, Roman Catholic, Greek Orthodox, Lutheran, Calvinist and all others virtually, that the law was good for Israel, but that Christians in the church are under grace and without law, or under some higher, newer law, is implicit polytheism. The Wacomite heresy has deeply infected the church. According to this heresy, the first age of man was the age of the father, the age of justice and the law. The second age was the age of the son, of Christianity, of the church and of grace. The third age is the age of the spirit, when men become gods and their own law. Dispensationalism is also either evolutionary or polytheistic, or both. God changes or alters his ways with man so that the law is administered in one age and not in another. One age sees salvation by works, another by grace, and so on. But Scripture gives us a contrary assertion. I am the Lord, I change not. Malachi chapter 3 verse 6 To attempt to pit law against grace is polytheistic or at least Manichaean. It assumes two ultimate ways and powers in contradiction to one another. But the word of God is one word and the law of God is one law because God is one. The word of God is a law word and it is a grace word. The difference is in men by virtue of God's election, not in God. 
The word blesses, and it condemns in terms of our response to it. To pray for grace is also to pray for judgment, and it is to affirm the truth and the validity of the law and the justice of the law. The whole doctrine of Christ's atonement upholds the unity of law, judgment and grace. Every form of antinomianism has elements of polytheism in it. Of antinomians, Fairbairn wrote, Some so magnify grace in order to get their consciences at ease respecting the claims of holiness and vindicate for themselves a liberty to sin that grace may abound, or which is even worse, deny that anything they do can have the character of sin because they are, through grace, released from the demands of law and so cannot sin. These are antinomians of the grosser kind, who have not particular texts merely of the Bible, but its whole tenor and spirit against them. Others, however, and these the only representatives of the idea, who in present times can be regarded as having an outstanding existence, are advocates of holiness after the example and teaching of Christ. They are ready to say, Conformity to the divine will, and that is obedience to commandments, is alike the joy and the duty of the renewed mind. Some are afraid of the word obedience, as if it would weaken love and the idea of a new creation. Scripture is not. Obedience and keeping the commandments of one we love is a proof of that love and the delight of the new creature. Did I do all right and not do it in obedience? I should do nothing right. Because my true relationship and heart reference to God would be left out. This is love, that we keep his commandments. Darby on the Law, page 3 and 4. So far, excellent. But then, these commandments are not found in the revelation of law, distinctly so called. The law, it is held, had a specific character and aim from which it cannot be disassociated and which makes it for all time the minister of evil. It is a principle of dealing with men which necessarily destroys and condemns them. This is the way, the writer continues, the Spirit of God uses law in contrast with Christ and never in Christian teaching puts men under it. Nor does Scripture ever think of saying, you are not under the law in one way, but you are in another. You are not for justification, but you are for a rule of life. It declares you are not under law, but under grace. And if you are under law, you are condemned and under a curse. How is that obligatory, which a man is not under, from which he is delivered? Ibid, page 4. Antinomianism of this description, distinguishing between the teaching or commandments of Christ and the commandments of the law, holding the one to be binding on the conscience of Christians and the other not, is plainly but partial antinomianism. It does not, indeed, essentially differ from neonomianism, since law only as connected with the earlier dispensation is repudiated, while it is received as embodying the principles of Christian morality and associated with the life and power of the Spirit of Christ. One, quote, evangelistic, end quote, association given to campus work has actually taught that the law was given by Satan, reported by this writer's daughter from a course taught on campus by a leader of this movement. Such a position can only be described as blasphemy. An example of this antinomianism from some unofficial Lutheran circles comes from a Sunday school manual. The Old Testament is treated, as is the New as a book to be mined or searched out for truths, so that studies of various books are prefaced with a few summary statements titled Truths You Will Find in the Book of Habakkuk. 
or truths you will find in the book of Matthew, and so on. Are we to assume the rest of each book is lies? In the introduction to the New Testament, we are told, The New Testament is the presentation of life under grace as it differs from life under law. But the Old Testament also presents life under grace, and both Old and New Testaments present life under grace as life under law, never as lawlessness. The alternative to law is not grace, it is lawlessness. Grace and election move in terms of law and under law. Reprobation is anti-law and anti-grace. Is it the purpose of churchmen to make the churches schools of reprobation? All this illustrates a second principle of the Shema Israel. One absolute, unchanging God means one absolute, unchanging law. Men's social applications and approximations of the righteousness of God may alter, vary and waver, but the absolute law does not. To speak of the law as for Israel, but not for Christians, is not only to abandon the law, but also to abandon the God of the law. Since there is only one true God and his law is the expression of his unchanging nature and righteousness, then to abandon the biblical law for another law system is to change God's. The moral collapse of Christendom is a product of this current process of changing God's. Bartianism, by asserting the, quote, freedom, end quote, of God to change, implying the evolving of an imperfect God, is asserting polytheism. Polytheism asserts many gods and many ways of salvation. It is not surprising that Karl Barth is at least implicitly universalistic. For Barth, all men can be or will be saved because there is no one absolute, unchanging law which judges all men. In his polytheistic worldview, all men can find one of any number of roads to salvation, if indeed it is salvation they need. For Bart, salvation is more realistically to be seen as self-realisation. It is the gnosis of election, the realisation that all men are elect in Christ, that is, free from an absolute God and an absolute decree and law. A third principle of the Shema Israel is that one God, one law, requires one total, unchanging and unqualified obedience. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart and with all thy soul and with all thy might. Deuteronomy chapter 6 verse 5 The Talmud translates might as money. The meaning is that man must obey God totally in any and every condition with all his being. Since man is totally the creature of God and since there is not a fibre of his being which is not the handiwork of God and therefore subject to the total law of God, there is not an area of man's life and being which can be held in reservation from God and his law. Therefore, as Deuteronomy chapter 6 verse 6 declares, And these words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart. Luther's comment on this verse is of interest in that it contained the seeds of antinomianism, which later became so deeply rooted in Lutheranism. He, Moses, wants you to know that the first commandment is the measure and yardstick of all others, to which they are to yield and give obedience. Therefore, if it is for the sake of faith and charity, you may kill, in violation of the fifth commandment, 
just as Abraham killed the kings. Genesis chapter 14 verse 15 And King Ahab sinned because he did not kill the king of Syria. 1 Kings chapter 20 verse 34 following Similar is the case of theft, ambush and trickery against the enemies of God. You may take spoils, goods, wives, daughters, sons and servants of enemies. So you should hate father and mother that you may love the Lord. Luke chapter 14 verse 26 In short, where anything will be against faith and love, There you shall not know that anything else is commanded by either God or man. Where it is for faith and love, however, you shall know that everything is commanded in all cases and everywhere. For the statement stands, These words shall be in your heart. There they shall rule. Furthermore, unless they are also in the heart, certainly no one will understand or follow this. Epikeia, or ever employ laws successfully, safely, or legally. Therefore, Paul says also in 1 Timothy chapter 1 verse 9, that the law is not set up for the righteous, for the reason that the fulfilling of the law is love from a good heart and from faith that is not feigned, 1 Timothy chapter 1 verse 5 which uses law lawfully when it has no laws and has all laws, no laws because none bind unless they serve faith and love, all because all bind when they serve faith and love. Therefore, this is Moses' meaning there. If you desire to understand the first commandment correctly and truly, not to have other gods act so that you believe and love one God, Deny yourself, receive everything by grace, and do everything gratefully. The confusions of this statement could only beget confusion. A fourth principle which follows from the Shema Israel is stated in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 7 to 9, verses 20 to 25. Education in the law is basic to and inseparable both from obedience to the law and from worship. The law requires education in terms of the law. Anything other than a biblically grounded schooling is thus an act of apostasy for a believer. It involves having another God and bowing down before him to learn from him. There can be no true worship without true education because the law prescribes and is absolute and no man can approach God in contempt of God's prescription. From Deuteronomy chapter 6 verse 8, Israel derived the use of the tefillin, the portions of the law bound upon the head or arm at prayer. Of chapter 6, verses 8 and 9, it has been observed. As these words are figurative and denote an undeviating observance to the divine commands, so also the commandment which follows, that is to say, to write the words upon the doorposts of the house and also upon the gates, are to be understood spiritually, and the literal fulfilment of such a command could only be a praiseworthy custom or well-pleasing to God when resorted to as the means of keeping the commandments of God constantly before the eye. The precept itself, however, presupposes the existence of this custom, which is not only met with in the Mohammedan countries of the East at the present day, but was also a common custom in ancient Egypt. What is required, certainly, is that mind and action family and home, man's vision and man's work, be all viewed in the perspective of God's law word. But this is not all. The literal fulfilment of the command concerning the frontlets and the posts, Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 8 and 9, is clearly required, as Numbers chapter 15, 
verses 37 to 41, compare Deuteronomy chapter 11, verses 18 to 20, makes clear. The blue thread required cannot be spiritualized away. God requires that he be worshipped according to his own word. Calvin's comment here on Numbers chapter 15, verse 38, was to the point. And, first of all, by contrasting the hearts and eyes of men with his law, he shows that he would have his people contented with that one rule which he prescribes without the admixture of any of their own imaginations. And again, he denounces the vanity of whatever men invent for themselves and however pleasing any human scheme may appear to them. He still repudiates and condemns it. And this is still more clearly expressed in the last word when he says that men go a-whoring whenever they are governed by their own counsels. This declaration is deserving of our especial observation, for whilst they have much self-satisfaction who worship God according to their own will, and whilst they account their zeal to be very good and very right, they do nothing else but pollute themselves by spiritual adultery. For what by the world is considered to be the holiest devotion, God with his own mouth pronounces to be fornication. By the word eyes, he unquestionably means man's power of discernment. It is regrettable that Calvin mars this by calling it a need of these coarse rudiments. Our Lord fulfilled this law and a woman touched the fringe or hem of his garment to be healed. Matthew chapter 9 verse 20 Jesus criticized the Pharisees for making large their fringes. Matthew chapter 23 verse 5 To boast of their ostensibly larger loyalty to the law. The commandment is repeated in Deuteronomy chapter 22 verse 12 so as to make clear its importance. Men dress in diverse and strange ways to conform to the world and its styles. What is so difficult or coarse about any conformity to God's law or any mode God specifies? There is nothing difficult or strange about this law, nor anything absurd or impossible. It is not observed by Christians because it was, like circumcision, the Sabbath, and other aspects of the Mosaic form of the covenants, superseded by new signs of the covenant as renewed by Christ. The law of the covenant remains. The covenant rites and signs have been changed. But the forms of covenant signs are no less honourable, profound and beautiful in the Mosaic form than in the Christian form. The change does not represent an evolutionary advance or a higher or lower relationship. The covenant was fulfilled in Jesus Christ, but God did not treat Moses, David, Isaiah, Hezekiah, or any of his Old Testament covenant people as lesser in his sight or more childish in ability and hence in need of coarse rudiments. In every age the covenant is all holy and wise. In every age the people of the covenant stand in terms of grace, not because of a higher personal ability or maturity. Worship in an unknown tongue, 1 Corinthians chapter 14, is a violation of this commandment, as is worship which lacks the faithful proclamation of God's word, or is without the education of the people of the covenant in terms of the covenant law word. A fifth principle, which is also proclaimed in this same passage, in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 20 to 25, is that, in this required education, it must be stressed that the response to grace is the keeping of the law, Children are to be taught that the meaning of the law is that God redeemed Israel out of bondage and that he might preserve us alive, commanded us to do all these statutes 
to fear the Lord our God for our good always. Chapter 6 verse 24 There is no warrant for setting this aside in either the Old or New Testament. Where the churches of the Old or New Testament have set up a false meaning to the law, that false meaning is attacked by prophets and apostles, but never the law of God itself. Because God is one. His grace and law are one in their purpose and direction. This passage makes pointedly clear the priority of God's electing grace in the call and redemption of his chosen people. The relationship of Israel was a relationship of grace and the law was given in order to provide God's people with the necessary and required response to grace and manifestation of grace, the keeping of the law. In Deuteronomy chapter 6 verses 10 to 15, another central point is made with respect to the implications of the Shema Israel. And it shall be, when the Lord thy God shall bring thee into the land which he swore unto thy fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, to give thee great and goodly cities, which thou didst not build, and houses full of good things, which thou didst not fill, and cisterns hewn out, which thou didst not hew, vineyards and olive trees, which thou didst not plant, and thou shalt eat and be satisfied. Then beware, lest thou forget the Lord, who brought thee forth out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Thou shalt fear the Lord thy God, and him shalt thou serve, and by his name shalt thou swear. Ye shall not go after other gods, of the gods of the peoples that are round about you. For a jealous God, even the Lord thy God, is in the midst of thee, lest the anger of the Lord thy God be kindled against thee, and he destroy thee from off the face of the earth. Thus, the sixth principle is the jealousy of God. This is a fact of cardinal importance. The chosen people are warned, as they occupy and possess a rich land which they did not develop, lest they forget God who delivered and prospered them. Seeing the wealth which came from a culture hostile to God, God's covenant people will be tempted to see other means to success and prosperity than the Lord. The temptation will be to go after other gods, the gods of the people round about. This is to believe that there is another law order than God's order. It is to forget that the success and the destruction of the Canaanites was alike the work of God. It is the provocation of God's wrath and jealousy. The fact that jealousy is associated repeatedly with the law and invoked by God in the giving of the law is of cardinal importance in understanding the law. The law of God is not a blind, impersonal and mechanically operative force. It is neither karma nor fate. The law of God is the law of the absolute and totally personal creator whose law operates within the context of his love and hate, his grace towards his people and his wrath towards his enemies. A current of electricity is impersonal. It flows in its specified energy when the conditions for a flow or discharge of energy are met. Otherwise, it does not flow. But the law of God is not so. It is personal. God restrains his wrath and patience and grace, or he destroys his enemies with an overrunning flood of judgment. Nahum chapter 1 verse 8 From a humanistic and impersonalistic perspective, both the mercy of God to Assyria, Jonah chapter 3 verse 1 to chapter 4 verse 3, 
And the judgment of God in Assyria, Nahum chapter 1 verse 1 to chapter 3 verse 19, seemed disproportionate, because an impersonal law is also an external law. It knows only actions, not the heart. Man, as he applies the law of God, must judge the actions of man. But God, being absolute, judges the total man with total judgment. The jealousy of God is therefore the certain assurance of the infallibility of God's court of law. The evil which so easily escapes the courts of state cannot escape the judgment of God, which, both in time as well as beyond time, moves in terms of the total requirements of his law. The jealousy of God is the guarantee of justice. An impersonal justice in a world of persons means that evil, being personal, can escape the net of the law and reign in laughing triumph. But the jealous God prevents the triumph either of Canaan or an apostate Israel or church. Without a jealous, personal God, no justice is possible. The doctrine of karma only enthrones injustice. It leads to the most vicious and callous kind of externalism and impersonalism. The people of karma spare their monkeys but destroy one another. Karma knows no grace because karma, in essence, knows no persons, only actions and consequences. The escape from karma becomes nirvana. The escape from life. This same passage declares, Thou shalt fear the Lord thy God, and him shalt thou serve, and by his name shalt thou swear. Deuteronomy chapter 6 verse 13 Luther's comment here is excellent. Therefore, you swear by the name of God, if you relate that by which you swear to God, and grasp it in the name of God, otherwise you would not swear if you knew it displeased him. Similarly, you serve God alone when you serve men in the name of God, otherwise you would not serve. By such swearing you safeguard your service to God alone, and are not drawn towards a godless work or oath. Thus, Christ also says in Matthew chapter 23, verses 16 to 22, that he who swears by the temple and altar and heaven swears by God. And in Matthew chapter 5, verses 35 and 36, he forbids to swear by Jerusalem, by one's head, by heaven, or by anything else, because in all these one swears by God. But to swear by God frivolously and emptily, is to take the name of God in vain. When, therefore, he desires oaths to be made by the name of God and no other, the reason is not only this, that for the truth, which is God, the confirmation of no one should be introduced except that of God himself, but also this, that man should remain in the servants of God alone, learn to relate everything to him, and to do, possess, use, and endure all in his name. Otherwise, if they employ another name, they would be diverted and become used to swearing as if it had nothing to do with God. And finally, through bad usage, they would begin to distinguish between the deeds by which God is served and those by which he is not served, when he wants to be served in all and wants all things to be done in fear because he is present to see and judge. Therefore, the oath is to be used in the same way as a sword and sexual intercourse are used. It is forbidden to take the sword, as Christ says, Matthew chapter 26, verse 52. He who takes the sword shall perish by the sword, because he takes it without a command and because of his own lust. But 
It is a command and a divine service to bear the sword if this is assigned by God or through man, for then it is born in the name of the Lord, for the good of the neighbour, as Paul says. He is the servant of God for your good. Romans chapter 13 verse 4 Thus, the fleshly use of sex is forbidden because it is a disorderly lust. Where, however, sex is associated with you by marriage, then the flesh should be used, and you render to the divine law, that is, to love what is demanded. In the same way, one should make use of an oath. You should swear, not for your own sake, but for the sake of God or your neighbour in the name of the Lord. Thus, you will always remain in the service of God alone. In the temptation of Jesus, two of the three answers to Satan are from Deuteronomy chapter 6. It is written again, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Matthew chapter 4 verse 7, Deuteronomy chapter 6 verse 16. And, Get thee hence, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. Matthew chapter 4 verse 10, Deuteronomy chapter 6 verse 13, chapter 10 verse 20. The third answer is taken from a related passage, Deuteronomy chapter 8 verse 3. But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Matthew chapter 4 verse 4 All three answers were responses to the temptation to test God, implicit to which was not merely questioning, but actually challenging God and his law word. A seventh principle which follows from the Shema Israel is declared in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 16 to 19. Ye shall not try the Lord your God, as ye tried him in Massa. Ye shall diligently keep the commandments of the Lord your God, and his testimonies, and his statutes, which he hath commanded thee. And thou shalt do that which is right and good in the sight of the Lord, that it may be well with thee and that thou mayest go in and possess the good land which the Lord swore unto thy fathers, to thrust out all thine enemies from before thee, as the Lord hath spoken. MTV It was this that Satan tried to tempt Jesus to do, to try God, to put God to the test, Israel tempted God at Massa by raising the question, Is the Lord among us or not? Ezekiel chapter 17 verse 7 The worship of Jehovah not only precludes all idolatry, which the Lord, as a jealous God, will not endure, see at Exodus chapter 20 verse 5, but will punish with destruction from the earth, the face of the ground, as in Exodus chapter 32 verse 12, but it also excludes tempting the Lord by an unbelieving murmuring against God if he does not remove any kind of distress immediately as the people had already sinned at Massa, that is, at Rephidim. Exodus chapter 17 verses 1 to 7. This seventh principle thus forbids the unbelieving testing of God God's law is the testing of man. Therefore, man cannot presume to be God and put God and his law word on trial. Such a step is a supreme arrogance and blasphemy. It is the opposite of obedience because it is the essence of disobedience to the law. Hence, it is contrasted to a diligent keeping of the law. Disobedience is the condition of blessing. It is the ground of conquest and of possession in terms of which the covenant people of God, his law people, enter into their inheritance 
tempting or trying God has other implications. According to Luther, The first way is not to use the necessary things that are at hand, but to seek others which are not at hand. So he tempts God who snores and does not want to work, taking for granted that he must be sustained by God without work, although God has promised to provide him through his work, as Proverbs chapter 10 verse 4 says. The hands of the busy prepare wealth, but the slack hand will hunger. This vulgar celibacy is like that too. Secondly, God is tempted when nothing needed is at hand except the bare and lone word of God. For here the godless are not content with the word, and unless God does what he promised at the time, in the place, and in the manner prescribed by themselves, they give up and do not believe. But to prescribe place, time or manner to God is actually to tempt him, and to feel about, as it were, whether he is there. But this is nothing else than to want to put limits on God and subject him to our will. In fact, to deprive him of his divinity. He should be free, not subject to bounds and limitations, and be the one who prescribes places, means and time to us. Therefore, both temptations are against the first commandment. The neglect of the Shema Israel and Deuteronomy chapter 6 has been part and parcel 